It is almost inevitable for a person to worry whenever he or a loved one is in serious trouble and there appears to be no solution. Unfortunately, there are Christians who will even defend worrying because they think it is a demonstration of care or responsibility. The truth is that worry is unhealthy and this has been medically proven. God doesn't want you trapped in it. He knows that matters will arise in life beyond your ability to deal with them. That is why He made a covenant with you through Christ so that you can take advantage of it and go beyond your human abilities. In the book of Psalms 55, 22, it says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. Also, in Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God has shown us from His Word what to do when trouble arises and we are tempted to worry. It is prayer accompanied with thanksgiving in anticipation of the manifested answer. If you have not seen the answer, continue thanksgiving and acknowledge the faithfulness of God to come through for you. Constantly pray in the Spirit because God may have spoken the answer in a word of wisdom to your spirit, but you could not pick it up. Even if the trouble seems to be getting worse, let your gaze be fixed on God and His Word. Decide to refuse to worry, and if you are a married man, teach your wife the same. When you worry, your mind and body come under unnecessary pressure, and this does not guarantee the solution you desire. You can be worried and not know it, but when a situation disturbs your peace of mind because you cannot find an immediate solution to it, then you are worried. And it happens like this because you are depending totally on your intellect. Do not limit yourself like this when you are united with God and He is willing to help you. It is written in 1 Corinthians 6.17, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. If you are born of God, you should not worry about anything because He is always with you. Start trusting Him today. This should begin with your diligence in studying the Bible, which reveals the true character of God. You can only trust someone when their character is good. God is good. He is love. He is light. Do not rely on the experience of someone else to know God. They may have a poor relationship with Him. When He sees your hunger to know Him, He will bring the right ministers and messages into your life to build you. By trusting God, you are agreeing with all that His Word says and allowing it to be your final authority. No matter what you face, never let His Word depart from your mouth. Do not accept any arising situation in your life contrary to the truth. Trusting God may not make your path to be smooth, but it makes it shine because God's Word is light. You need to understand that life is a long-distance race filled with uncertainties, but learning to trust God always stabilizes your life and keeps you going. You cannot see God because He is no physical form, but you can His Word in your heart. It should be your source of wisdom for navigation. As long as His Word is in you, you do not need Him to appear. If He does, it is to confirm His written Word made available to you. There are Christians who say trusting God is a risk. They will rather trust a man they can see. But the Bible declares, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 5 Trusting only in man means that your heart has departed from the Lord, and there will be consequences because God knows the limits and tendencies of men. Always exalt what God says above what anyone tells you. They can be medical doctors, business experts, economic or weather forecasters. It makes no difference. God's word is far superior to them all. Whatever anyone knows is only a tiny measure of the knowledge that God possesses. Look at what the Bible says about the person who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river 
and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. When you study and meditate on the above scripture, it should inspire you to trust God to understand all circumstances. Fear will be eliminated from your mind. There is nothing you cannot give, and there is nowhere you cannot go in obedience to God, because you are assured that the outcome will be favorable. Abraham could sacrifice his only son Isaac in obedience to God, because he had to know that God raises the dead. You will not see much of God's power manifested in your life without trusting Him. There is absolutely no reason to play safe with God. You are always safe when you are in tune with Him. What is God telling you to do? He will empower you for it. Where is He leading you to go? He will go with you. You can stop worrying no matter what the issues are. God is telling you to do so because He wants to take responsibility for your life. Christ is in your life. He can make what has not been working to start working. Just entrust it to Him and be willing to follow His instructions. He will lead into glory. And His instructions may be radically different from what you know, but trust Him all the way. Be willing to spend a lot of time waiting on God before embarking on a major project or investment. God is not affected by changing situations. He never changes, but is ever relevant. When you trust Him in your business, for instance, you will always make profits because He will guide you continually. Think of the man Peter, the fisherman. When he recognized Jesus walking on the water towards them, he said, If you are the one, command me to come to you. This is how Peter also walked on water. He trusted his master. When you worry, you are not enjoying life as you should. Look at the things that are working in your life and consistently give thanks to God. There are people who desire what you have. Do not despise it. Many times, God works miracles on the issues you worry about when your focus is no longer on them. Turn away from the issues that you worry about and turn to the Lord instead. If Paul and Silas were focused on their predicament, they would have been worried, but they prayed and sang praises aloud to God at midnight right inside the prison. It is so easy to become worried, discouraged, and depressed in prison, but not for the man or woman who has learned to trust God. Apostle Paul wrote some epistles from jail. He will not turn against you. His faithfulness is forever, but man is subject to disappointments and failure. The major reason for the breakup of relationships is a breach of trust. It destroys marriages and businesses. Maybe the people you trusted failed you again and again, but God is not a man. He always keeps his word. He was with Jacob in the house of Laban the Syrian, who brought him out wealthy. Jacob had flaws, but he trusted God. What about Joseph? God was with him in Egypt, and he knew it. That was why he trusted the Lord even as a slave. See how he ended up because he trusted God all through. You cannot trust God and regret it. Just don't quit. The truth is that whether or not you trust God, it does not change him. But it is always in your best interest to trust. If you want to see the greatness of God in any area of your life, then trust him. There is another beautiful scripture that talks about the implication of trusting God. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Psalm 125, 1 KJV. Hallelujah! You abide forever in prosperity, health, marriage, safety, and favor by trusting in the Lord. Abraham was blessed in all things at the end of his life. He transferred his wealth to his son Isaac. God had to tell Moses to go and die. Jacob, at the point of his death, gathered his children and prophesied to them. The lives of those who trust God are glorious. Your life can be this way too if you entrust it to the same God. God will run your life far better than any company or government. It is a shame that some Christians trust human institutions more than God. 
companies fold up, governments fail, but God is ever dependable. Do not trust in God in minor issues only. Trust with big challenges, because that is what reveals His true capacity. Do not trust God for what man can do for you. Do not consider the opinion of anyone before you trust God. They just might discourage you by telling you stories of how they trusted Him for something, but it never came. Remain expectant that the issues will be resolved, even if you have no idea how. Let my praises of God continually flow out of your mouth. You cannot trust God and be silent. Be calm, but do not be quiet. Be filled with rejoicing always. Voice out your trust in songs. Associate with fellow Christians who know what it means to trust God. Be stable in your local assembly and serve there. Refuse to allow any issue to break your commitment to God. And if it is possible, involve your family in trusting God. It is rough to trust God when you are among skeptics. Another important point for you to bear in mind about trusting God is that it will sometimes require sacrifice. For instance, Moses the prophet had to forfeit his privileged position in the palace of Egypt in pursuit of his destiny. Finally, when God comes through for you on those issues, do not go back trusting in yourself or other men. You have made spiritual progress that should not and must not be lost. Life has not ended. There will be others to trust God for. Each day I wake up the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 give me hope. Apostle Paul reminds us to be thankful always, and I have chosen to do exactly that. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. King David reminds you to be thankful and praise your God always in Psalm 103, verses one through four. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Do not be afraid, for death will no longer exist in heaven. Death shall be permanently swallowed up by God. Oh, the aching hearts of those who have watched their loved ones pass away. We've heard physicians say things like, I'm sorry, I tried everything I could. When Jesus visited Mary and Martha after Lazarus died, Mary informed him that if he had been present, her brother would not have died. John 11, verse 32. Isn't this how we felt on occasion? The day will come when death will pass away. Death shall be swallowed by God. Perhaps there will be a lot of praise. We'll be rejoicing with God for the rest of our lives. Consider that for a moment. Isn't it amazing? Yes, that's correct. All of our tears will be wiped away and all wrongs will be righted. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Fear is one of the enemy's most often used weapons against us. Worry, worry and dread may engulf us in a dense cloud of uncertainty, dictating our every move and choice. War, conflict, persecution, Violence, crime, natural catastrophes, terrorism, economic instability, unemployment, divides, sickness, and death flourish in today's world. We are concerned about our children's future, our family's future, our financial future, and our safety. The list goes on and on and on. There's actually a lot we may be concerned about, yet in truth, much of what we spend our time worrying about never comes to pass. It's difficult to live with the weight of what ifs on your shoulders. For the past year, I've battled anxiety and fear, but over time, I saw the things that used to make me uneasy were no longer having the same effect on me. It didn't happen overnight, but over the course of days, weeks, and months. I read words of life and truth in the Bible. 
soaking them in over and over again while praying aloud. They replaced the other things in my head that I'd been fighting against until they got so familiar. Change has occurred. Anxious thoughts started to just fade away. Worry let go of its suffocating hold. His words are life words, soothing to the soul, relaxing to the spirit, and instilling strength in our days. I have something to say to you. You're not on your own. You are God's child. We can always trust God's word. You need power in your life, but true strength comes from relying on Christ, who has promised that his grace is sufficient for all the challenges you may face. For his strength is perfected in your weakness. For when you are weak in your own abilities, you become strong in the Lord and in the might of his might. We all need love in our lives, but truly godly love is something that can only be created in us as spiritual fruit. When we dwell in Christ and he in us, God will not abandon you to your problems on your own. He will provide you with the strength you need. He will be with you even when you are despised by your mates. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You need sound judgment and disciplined mind, but you can't do it on your own. But if you look to Jesus and willingly submit to the Holy Spirit's ongoing chastening work within, you will experience an inexplicable inner peace that passes understanding. Because this is God's promise to all whose minds are resting in Christ, we praise and thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Holy Spirit who lives inside us. We are grateful that you have not given us a sacred spirit, but rather one of power and love, as well as a sound intellect. In this increasingly hostile society, may you not be afraid of rejection or mockery, nor of persecution, agony, or even death. God is there with you in every step. Prayer will solve all your worry because it's a privilege for those who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. You are instructed to not be concerned about anything, but to pray confidently about everything instead. You are to tell the Lord of your wants, respectfully presenting your pleas to him and praising him for everything he has done. You are not to be concerned about anything, but rather bring all of your concerns to the Lord in prayer you must pray correctly, which we can only do if we abide in Christ and he in us. You are to keep your heart free of anxiety and worrying, and the only way to do so is to throw all your worries and concerns on the Lord Jesus since he is concerned about you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Nothing is too big or too tiny for the Lord, and nothing is too small for us to approach fearlessly to the throne of grace. There is no fear so great that it cannot be calmed by God's perfect serenity, and no suffering so severe that it cannot be relieved by His gentle touch. We talk to ourselves when we are worried. We communicate with God via prayer. Worry focuses on life circumstances, but prayer focuses on our Heavenly Father. Worry is self-centered and selfish, and it stems from the sin of unbelief. But prayer is God-centered and pleasant to Him since it is founded on a heart that trusts His Word and relies on Him for all of our needs. Christ also told you to bring all your troubles and burdens to him. In Christ, you are in safe hands. We are rescued by faith, and we must continue to live by faith. Every worrisome thought is driven from our hearts by faith, and when faith in our Heavenly Father is expressed in prayers and supplications, with thankfulness, our requests may be made in peace and assurance that he will hear and respond. May we keep a grateful heart of thanksgiving and praise for all of his goodness and grace to us. And may we be anxious about nothing, but make our requests known to him 
in everything through our grateful prayers and entreaties, and we will discover his peace that passes our understanding, guarding our heart and mind as we abide in Christ and he in us. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. He is the one who informs us that we should not be worried. He asks us to put all of our worries on him, knowing that he loves us and pledges to be with us forever. The Lord Jesus commands us not to be discouraged or disheartened because he is our God, and that reality should be enough. Don't be afraid, he begs us. Do not be concerned about your surroundings, he encourages, because I am your God. Don't be afraid, I will strengthen you. I will certainly assist you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Shouldn't we just take God's word for it and not be afraid when he tells us not to worry since he sent his son to us? I hope you pay attention because God has promised you three things. To begin with, you have nothing to fear since he has promised to strengthen all that is his. You are his. Second, the Lord promises that in addition to providing all of your needs, he will be an ever-present aid in times of hardship. God is your shelter and strength, a constant source of assistance in your times of distress. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, the Lord Jesus himself assured. Third, his assurance reaches out his loving arms even farther, promising to sustain you with his rightful right hand and to keep your steps from falling by and folding you in his righteous arms. Man was made for community. He was created to interact with God's entire creation. It is no wonder you have ears to listen, not just to yourself, but primarily other things around you. It is no wonder you have a mouth to speak or make sounds, not just to yourself, but also primarily to other things around you. You have feet to take you to places and hands to hold things. Our entire making announces that we are here to connect. It is a beautiful masterpiece woven together by God's great design. However, as you grow in understanding and mature in person, you will find out a little fact about yourself. Sometimes, God would want you to be alone. The thought of this can be scary to imagine, don't you think? That's right. There is a lot that we can do together. Unity can never be overemphasized. Teamwork, support, and company can give us the boost that we may not be able to give ourselves when we need it. We can see from our interaction with each other that honestly, we need one another. You give so much hope knowing that you've got someone. You give so much assurance that you are not alone. You have people you can always call upon and they will answer. Jesus talked about this in Luke 11, five through eight. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer them. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. You are bold to connect when you have the assurance of support. You are not afraid to knock on doors that are always going to open to you. You could go out and return home at night without fear of being shut outside. Why? Because you know there is a place for you inside. Yet, permit me to say that in your walk with God, as you get intimate with Him, you will come to points no one is required to walk with you except you alone. In this journey of life, my friend, there are terrains you cross with family, with friends, with colleagues, with spouses, with children, and so on. But there are terrains that no one crosses with you. What are the necessities and values of this terrain? 
Why does God want me to cross them? Must I walk them alone? Maybe you are asking yourself these questions right now as you listen to my voice. Or maybe you have asked yourself before, is something wrong with me? Do I scare people away with my personality no matter how hard I try and how good I seem to be? It's almost like no one wants me. Those that do eventually just leave. Maybe I'm just bad luck and I end up destroying good things. The ones I love and care for don't love me in return. I feel used, taken advantage of, and then dumped. God, what's happening? Have you forgotten about me? I may not know what your question may be or where you are right now. However, I want you to know that being alone sometimes on this journey is a blessing and not a curse. It's not about something being wrong with you, but about God trying to make everything right with your destiny. Yes, God spoke of Adam when he needed a spouse that it was not good for man to be alone and gave him a helpmeet for a wife. Maybe you need one now too, and it seems this time yours is different. It is not so, my friend. Ecclesiastes 3.1 There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. You see, the same God sets things in such a way that nothing is a mistake, and everything takes place in their time. In the right time, He can bless you with the right company, and at the right time, He can cause you to be alone. Romans 8.28 And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. In all these, God is working something out for your good. You need to grow in this understanding. Yes, what is the benefit of God wanting me alone sometimes? Rest. There is so much toxicity out there in this world. So much weight, so many battles, so many uncertainties. Things that challenge your faith, your trust, and your entire belief system from its core. Some of these come from our interactions with everyday people. From these interactions, we collect so much information, sometimes even without knowing. Some of this unhealthy information may cause you to struggle without knowing why. Some of them may get you entangled with things you weren't supposed to have a business with. They become heavy weights you have to carry with you everywhere you go until God steps in and says, Hey, that's enough. When God wants you to be alone sometimes, He could make stuff happen to you or with you in such a way that some people close to you stay away or aren't able to connect with you as they used to. Some challenges are not what you think they are. Some bad things are actually good things in disguise. Have you ever been so hard pressed that you had nowhere to turn to, no one to run to because no one was there? What do you think? At this time, here is what God was saying. Come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You think you are being abandoned, but no. God is isolating you to give you rest. Do you battle with the pressures of relationship with family, spouse, children, and work? What if it is all a sign that God is calling you to something bigger than what you are seeing? A rescue call to save that connection you love by taking a few steps back to rejuvenate yourself. My lover said to me, Rise up, my darling. Come away with me, my fair one. Songs of Solomon 2.10 Am I saying that God is calling you to abandon your family, your spouse, your business? Oh, no. Please understand me. The necessity of sometimes being alone is that God can use that to give you speed, strength, making you ten times better in every way for the people and things you care for. You cannot continue to be a blessing to anyone when you are worn out, can you? You cannot be the best wife, the best husband, the best employee, the best person when you feel drained by everything and everyone. Instead, you may find yourself in the wrong, in the negative, unfruitful, destructive instead of constructive. Yet in the midst of this, what you need is time out where it is just you and God alone. There is fresh air here. There is peace here. There is no pressure here. There is comfort here. There is loving correction here. Once Jesus and his disciple had been so engaged in the work of ministering to others, they woke up to meet the crowd and only rested when the crowd left at the end of the day. Here's what the Bible said Jesus did. 
Mark 6, 30 through 32. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they all went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. There are many reasons why God may want you alone, but chief among them is to give you rest and the enjoyment of his company, the only one that counts. Rest from the noise, rest from the pressures, healing. Sometimes God wants you to be alone so that you can heal. Many arrows pierce us on all sides every day as we journey through life. Being alone with God will make us up to healing. Their broken hearts will be mended. Hopes once lost will be rekindled. Remember, he has said, I am the God that heals your wounds. No doubt being alone can be scary sometimes, but do not let the fear of loneliness deny you of the blessedness of coming to a place where you just lean into God and Him alone. Empowered to be 10 times better. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. To be surrounded with a crowd without God is a problem, but to have God in the time of need is a treasure worth more than the whole world put together. 1 Samuel 14, 6. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Nothing can stop God when you have him on your side, my friend. Hence, when it seems like he is calling you to time alone with him, don't run away from it. Embrace it instead. Seek for some time away from everything while maintaining your sense of responsibility where necessary, but make sure your sole attention is on him. Focus on the things he shows you. Pour out everything on your heart before him. Pour out the failures there. Pour out the fears there. Lay all your achievements before him and then embrace him. Let him know that he is all you have and need. Then let him perfect his purpose in your life. Allow him to remove the things you don't need and build up within your heart the things you do. Let him replace your weakness with his strength. Let him circumcise your heart and correct your motives. Let him break habitual circles that threaten your peace and well-being. Sometimes, when God wants you to be alone, he wants you to be with him because he is the only one who will never leave you. Remember this, good company is a blessing from God, but never abandon God for good company. When God is all you have, then you have all you need forever. Embrace your alone time. It will prepare you for what is ahead. When you come out, you will have the strength to keep going when others are wearing out. God bless you. When you read the Bible properly, you'll see that it depicts the character of God, the way he thinks, his desire for man, and how he responds to various issues as it affects them, especially those that are in covenant with him through the blood of Jesus Christ. When God made man, he gave him a mandate, but he also gave him the capacity to make choices concerning his life. Although God made you in his own image and likeness, you are very limited in knowledge and wisdom relative to him. There is so much you do not know. It takes time and life experiences for you to learn things. But every day you will have decisions to make and they depend on what you know and your state of mind. The implication of this is that you'll make mistakes that'll cause you difficulty in the issues that come up in life. God, being a loving father, wants to help you through the difficulties as they come your way. It does not matter to him that they were self-inflicted. He is merciful. He will do what it takes to get your attention so that he can reach out to you. But he will not violate your will. He will seek your cooperation for anything he desires to do as it concerns you. God wants you to invite him into your difficulties. Although he's always with you and he's compassionate towards your plight, 
He only gets involved in your situations to the extent that you allow him. In the book of Hosea 4, 6, the Bible declares, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The reason for your difficulties is often due to things that you're ignorant of. And for as long as you do not know, your difficulties will persist. But God knows all things, past, present, and future. If you let him into your difficulties, he will bring you out of them. It may not happen instantly, but it is sure. So he says to you in the book of Isaiah, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Isaiah 1, 19. God does not take pleasure in your pain. He is concerned about your difficulties, and he knows exactly what to do. If you seek man's help, they may be capable, but unwilling. They certainly cannot do anything beyond the limits of what they know. This is why if you go to a doctor to complain about your health, they will sometimes refer you to a specialist. In other words, your condition is beyond what they know and can attend to. Some people will not even let you know that they cannot help you. They would rather guess. But God is never intimidated by any situation because he can reverse it no matter how bad it is. Jesus Christ knew this quite well. So when Mary and Martha sent a message to him from Bethany that his friend Lazarus was sick, he was not alarmed. He knew that his response will always be timely and precise. So he simply said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Then he remained where he was afterward. The full account of this story is found in John 11. Difficulties are not always traceable to ignorance or mistakes. They could be a normal part of the process, but even then, going through them is a lot easier and beneficial if you invite God in. He takes control of the situation and regulates the harm done to you by the difficulties. This is what happened to Daniel, a Hebrew slave in the land of Babylon. During the reign of King Darius, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for his dedication to God in prayers. But God sent his angels to shut the mouth of the lions. No man could have done this for Daniel. Angels are still very much around today. And when you invite God into your difficulties, he comes in with them to do what nobody else can do. Do not give up because men failed you. Invite God in. He'll not laugh or mock you like some folks will do. In the book of Luke 5, Peter allowed Jesus into his boat after he had toiled all night without catching fish. But when Jesus instructed him to cast his net again, he got a miraculous haul of fishes. God is not a fault finder, but a way maker. He will not help you because you're perfect. He'll do it because you believe him. And he is compassionate. In the book of Luke 1, 37, angel Gabriel said unto Virgin Mary, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Invite God into your marriage. Invite God into your business. Invite God into your health. His superior wisdom will be at your disposal. He will make you wonder. Daniel was among the Jews carried away in captivity in Babylon. He found himself a slave in a foreign land, but he carried God along with him. That was why he did not have the mentality of a slave. It was the same with Joseph. He was indeed a slave in Egypt, but he did not have a slavery mentality because he knew that God was with him. When you invite God into the difficulty, he will give you a proper perspective on it. He will make you realize that the circumstance is temporary so that you can endure it with a positive attitude. One likely reason you're reluctant to invite God into your difficulties is distrust. You think he might ask you for too much but this is not the way he is. Whatever God will require of you in that situation is precisely what you need to do to come out of that difficulty. It might not make any sense to you, but it is the key. Consider a few scenarios. Was it reasonable for Abraham, who had his first son with Sarah, his wife, at the age of 100, to willingly offer him as a sacrifice in obedience to God? Yet this is what happened, and it turned Abraham's life around forever. Simon the fisherman 
had deployed all his know-how and experience in fishing one day, but he ended up catching nothing. Yet when Jesus Christ told him to launch out again with assurance, he obeyed and got a miracle. Later on, the same Simon Peter was drowning in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ until he cried out for help and was rescued. Basically, you invite God by calling upon Him in prayer. But there are other ways. There was something else that young King Solomon found out and did to invite God. His difficulty was that he was made the king of Israel as a young man with no idea what to do. Look at what he did and how God responded in the verses below. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy according to as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? In the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked for the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. 1 Kings 3, 4-13 If King Solomon could invite God into his difficulty by means of sacrifice, you certainly can. Just follow what's in your heart in this regard. But you need to first turn away from the difficulty and focus on God, recognizing that you have access to Him and that there's no barrier. Don't dwell on your inadequacies. Consider His unlimited ability. If you've given up hope in your difficulties, then you'll find it unhelpful to invite God. You'll conclude that there's no way out, and even God may not get your attention. Oh, but you can be like the prophet Moses, who knew what it means to have the presence of God amidst difficulties. Moses did not invite the presence of God. He insisted on it in a conversation they had. And he said unto them, If thy presence goes not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Exodus 33, 15-17 Sometimes it seems like God is closest when men have failed and abandoned you, because you may never seek God if you have men around you to run to. It's only when you realize how limited they are that your heart can long for God. So, if you're alone, now is the right time to invite God. There's no need for you to be bitter towards anyone over past disappointments. God came to Abraham after Lot's departure. God came to wrestle with Jacob when he was left alone. He will come when you invite him into the difficulty. It's up to you. God is waiting.
Failure is something every man at some point in his life has to deal with. It is part of life's process. However, as much as it is part of a man's journey, it is not meant to be the end. For the believer, failure is a stepping stone to improvement, betterment, and perfection. For the believer, failure is a call to draw closer to God. Many of us are familiar with failure and we know what it is like to fail even when great efforts are made to avoid it. Sadly, not all of us can say today that we did not let our experience with failure be the end. Not all of us can say, I did not quit, I did not give up, I did not throw in the towel, I did not let the devil win. When we get overwhelmed or when we feel defeated, it is easier to walk out the door than to strive harder. It is easier to throw hope out the window in the face of tough situations than to stand strong. However, it is important that we remember that the Lord rarely, if at all he does, demands something that is easy to do. The believer has been called to stand firm in the face of challenges and to soar when storms come. The believer has been called not to quit after failure. Quitting after failure would cause you to miss out on success and fulfilling your purpose. You never know how soon you might start seeing progress, manifestations, and answers if you stay a little longer, if you hold on to hope, if you hang in there and give it a little more time. You see, everything good takes time. It takes time to build something that can outlive a man. It takes time to make great things. Take a look at the things around you. Your smartphone, the airplane, electricity, clothes, shoes, your car, the elevator in your building, and so many more were not built in a day. Success, fulfilling purpose, wealth, influence takes time to build and to achieve. God desires that you have good things. He said in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. God wants us to succeed in every way, but we must stand strong and not quit after failure. Every time you fail, you are presented with an opportunity to improve because each test, each trial gives you new information which influences and improves the next model. Not getting it right the first time or the hundredth time is not a sign that you should quit. It's simply a way for you to keep learning how to do it better next time. In whatever area you want to succeed, you can if you put in the work and stay strong when failure hits. The stories we hear of overnight success, rise to fame, big winnings are always preceded by years of struggle and work, and more importantly, years of failing and getting back up again. There are no instant successes, what makes success look instant is the failures that happen in the secret and the rising up from them. There's a long, narrow, and hard road to success. But when success hits, we only focus on the last mile or so. It looks so easy and makes for such a great story that we ignore the miles and miles of obscurity, difficulty, and perseverance required to get that hilltop of glory. Those seemingly overnight stories makes us feel that if we haven't achieved a high level of success in a matter of days or months, we must be doing something wrong. And we are. We're listening to make-believe stories, as they were guidelines to how life actually worked. If you give up now, you don't know what you could have achieved and what the world, generations to come, might be missing because of you. Child of God, your purpose and your fulfilling it is connected to other lives. You cannot afford to fail, or rather you cannot afford to fail and quit. Do not ever come to the decision that your success does not matter or that your losses are too great. Don't listen to the devil who is telling you to give up. He knows that if you don't quit, you will succeed and your successes will influence others one way or the other. The devil wants you to settle for less than what God has in store for you. He wants you to settle for average when God has given us an excellent spirit. Average never changed the world. Average never delivered nations. Average never made kings. Average is not good enough. No, 
not for you, not for me, and not for God's people. A preacher once said, the life of a Christian can be described in one of four ways. As a journey, as a battle, as a pilgrimage, and as a race. Select your own metaphor, but the necessity to finish is always the same. For if life is a journey, it must be completed. If life is a battle, it must be finished. If life is a pilgrimage, it must be concluded. And if it is a race, it must be finished. You cannot finish your God-given assignment if you quit after failure. Whether it be your first, second, or hundredth experience, we are running a race that must be finished. This race demands that we stand up and run every time we fall. This race demands that we run with hope. This race demands that we be patient and that we be aligned with heaven's mandate. No matter how many times you fail, child of God, do not quit. It may hurt, but stand up again. It may be easier to stay down, but as a child of God, you must stand up again. James 5, 7 through 8 says, Therefore be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the soil, being patient concerning it until it receives the early and late rains. You should also be patient, strengthen your heart, because the coming of the Lord is near. We are commanded, directed and instructed to become patient and to stand firm, and this command is until the Lord's coming. You need to persevere so when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. This is what the scripture says. Yes, it is easier to give up than to wait patiently. James illustrated patience and standing firm to a farmer who waits patiently for his crops to yield and to stand firm in waiting for the rains. A farmer will not abandon his crops because rain has not fallen or because there are still seedlings in the soil. No, he waits until the harvest comes and he is rewarded for his perseverance. In Romans 12:12, 12, 12, the Apostle Paul tells us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. See, life may be throwing you hard blows, but child of God, be joyful, be patient, be faithful, and don't quit. You may have failed and failed and failed, but child of God, do not quit. Success is ahead, and God wants you to know that today you are almost at the end of your journey. Just stay a little more. Whatever it is you have to do, make sure you get to the finish line. Finish that project. Complete that mission. Finish that assignment. Finish that race. Complete that course. Don't quit. No. Don't give up because you have failed. Do not allow failure to be the end of your story. The best things, the things that matter most, are the most difficult. A great relationship, a career you can be proud of, a family, serving, innovating, helping others. All those require deep thought, self-control, self-sacrifice, and a willingness to put in a lot of effort over a long amount of time. But what could be better than the results you get from such an effort? Some of us are frustrated right now. Some of us cannot seem to understand how God is with us even when we fail. We can't seem to see God's will in our failures, but we are wrong because God's plan sometimes involves a lot of messy paths that lead us to a glorious end. Even when we fail, we are able to see God in it and draw strength from Him rather than question our circumstances. Oppressed by the noonday heat, a tired farmer sat under a walnut tree to rest. Relaxing, he looked at his pumpkin vines and said to himself, how strange it is that God puts such a big heavy pumpkins on a frail vine that has so little strength, it has to trail on the ground and then look up into the cool branches of the tree above him, he added. How strange it is that God put small walnut on such a big tree with big branches so strong they could hold a man. Just then the breeze dislodged the walnut from the tree. The tired farmer wandered no more as he rubbed his head ruefully and said, it is a good thing there wasn't a pumpkin up there instead of a walnut. Hopefully, when the breezes of life blow, you will remember that God who is great wise, loving, and powerful, makes no mistakes. He deserves our praise under any circumstances. 
So child of God, your failure is not a mistake. It is an opportunity to get stronger, to improve, to get better. God makes no mistakes. So if the path he has led you to is full of failures, stay. Every time you try and fail, you learn something about yourself, about life, and you gain experience that can help you to do better next time. God wants us to be like Job, who in Job 13:15 said, though he slays me, yet will I hope in him. Job had seemingly failed in a lot of ways, but he chose to seek God in his situation and his confessions proved Job did not quit. His life had, some say, ended, but he got it all back because he did not quit, nor did he walk away from God. James 1-2 says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Allow God to keep you firm. Allow him to clean you up after you fall. Allow him to help you deal with your failures till you are mature and complete, lacking nothing. I mean, you have been trying for years on your own and now you wanna give up? Why not try God? Why not try letting God help you? Listen, you should not quit after failure because not only will it leave you dissatisfied, but it also makes God sad. The world is counting on us believers to do better, go higher, succeed, and change the narrative of a lot of things. Just don't quit after failure.